The other top story tonight, critics blasting Republican policies that they say suppress votes in top races. This story drawing intense scrutiny all over the place because it's not in one or two states, but more of a trend. Crackdowns that disparately impact minorities who tend to vote Democratic. In Georgia, early voting underway with Republican Brian Kemp leading Stacey Abrams by about two points. But he's not just the candidate for governor. He's using his post as secretary of state to hold up tens of thousands of voter registrations, 70 percent of them. African-American voters or in Texas, where Ted Cruz debates Beto O'Rourke tonight, the state attorney general prosecuting about three dozen people on charges of voter fraud. Now, that is more than the previous five years combined. Critics say it may intimidate many lawful voters. And then there's a big story that my colleague Rachel Maddow has been reporting on. Heidi Heidkamp fighting in a red state where Republicans should have a big edge anyway, but where they are taking extreme measures that critics say would suppress the votes of Native Americans. What they specifically were working to get rid of in that state was your ability to vote if your ID doesn't have a street address on. Native Americans in North Dakota, at double the rate of everybody else, don't have street addresses on their IDs. If the Republicans can turn off the Native American vote, if they can end that, they can run the table. They don't have to worry about there being any U.S. senators from the Democratic Party. I am joined by Donna Brazil back at the table and Ari Berman, a senior reporter for Mother Jones, the author of Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America, and a journalist who's been tracking this uh, for a long time before it was really in the national spotlight. Uh, Donna, when you look at this, is this targeting black voters and minorities and Native Americans as you see there? Yes. Sadly, it is. It's a great stand of our democracy, not only in Georgia, the purging of people in the state of Indiana, the failure to process voter registration uh, cards uh, in Miami-Dade, the failure to understand that uh, some of the voter registration forms, as you know, today is the deadline to, to register to vote in several states, including Maryland, where there's an important gubernatorial race. Yes, this is systematic. It has been going on for decades, but it's getting worse. Everybody should vote, but we should not have to not only protect people uh, right to vote. At the same time, we're asking people to vote because it really sends a message that why bother? Mm. Well, and in Georgia, Ari, you've seen this laid out in a way where if you were a Martian and you landed <laughs> in America and you said, wait, the person in charge of the election and its fairness is also running in it. It makes no sense. That's before you get to what Brian Kemp is accused of. I want to play both candidates in that race, both sides, if you will, of that story, and then get, get your analysis. Let's take a look. So the, the challenge is twofold. One is that we know this is a flawed system that has a disproportionate effect on people of color, but it also has the ability to erode trust in our system. That's a smoke screen trying to hide her radical views. Those folks that are on the pending list, all they have to do is go to the polls, show their photo ID, and they can vote. Again, this is just a distraction. Well, Georgia is really the epicenter of voter suppression right now, Ari, at every level. I mean, they were the first state to pass a voter ID law in 2005, so they really kicked mm -hmm. off this movement to make it harder to vote. They have closed 214 polling places. You have the second largest county in Georgia, which just sued today for rejecting one in 10 absentee ballots. The disproportionate impact is enormous. You have 14 percent of Asian Americans, 8 percent of African Americans, 4 percent of Hispanics are having ballots rejected compared to only 2.5 percent of whites. Then you have the Secretary of State who's also running for governor, as you mentioned, blocking 53,000 people from registering to vote. And it's a very confusing process now for them. But this is bigger than Georgia. Mm -hmm. 24 states have passed new restrictions on voting since the 2010 election. We just got out of an election that was the first presidential election in 50 years without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act because the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act where black turnout fell dramatically. And instead of fixing that problem, instead of trying to get black turnout up okay. and Latino turnout up and Asian American turnout up and young turnout up, we've done the opposite, which is states from Georgia to Texas to North Dakota to Wisconsin are now making it harder to vote in an election that's going to be razor thin mm. in places like Georgia and you're Florida and North Dakota. You're saying what, what you're reporting as suppression efforts could actually make the margin. Absolutely. You look yes. at North Dakota, which Rachel Maddow has been covering. Hattie Hedkamp won her first election to the Senate by 3,000 votes. Right. She got 80 percent support from Native Americans there. Now you have a voter ID that could, that could disenfranchise 5,000 Native American voters. 
20% of whom don't have the right IDs because they wrote the law that's such a right. way for no reason to exclude tribal IDs from being accepted. So that's one race alone. But in Georgia and North Dakota, in Florida and other key states, suppression could make the difference in this election. And, and also in states like Texas. Remember, Rachel has also been reporting on what's going on at Prairie View. And what worries me also is that Hurricane Florence, Hurricane Michael, mm. they have impacted areas in both uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, also in Florida and Georgia, where the precincts are in minority communities. And will they be open? Will right. the voters in those areas be told where to go to vote? Well, people often talk about where does Donald Trump get his slogans and his talking points. Right. And the answer is he plagiarizes them from other people, from other <laughs> Republicans. Just so Make point. America Great Again mm -hmm. is literally Ronald Reagan's re-election slogan. It wasn't obscure, it was literally the slogan. Right. Uh, and so I don't recall Donald Trump in the 90s or the 2000s talking a lot about voter fraud. He picked this up like so many other things because right. he learned what, what the modern Republican Party is doing. Uh, take a look at Trump playing up this issue. But they even want to try and rig the election at the polling booths. And voter fraud is all too common. And then they criticize us for saying that. Oh, that voter fraud. You know, these politicians are brutal. They're brutal. There is the issue of voter fraud. Isn't it amazing the way they say there's no voter fraud? Voter fraud is the new dog whistle. It's the new welfare queens That's in right. Cadillacs. And it's used as an excuse to then push policies that suppress the vote. And you know who Donald Trump got it from? He got it from Republican secretaries of state like Chris Kobach in That's Kansas, right. like Brian Kemp in Georgia, who are That's now right. running for governor to be the chief officials in their state. So this is really, really serious. These guys who gave Trump this massive lie are on the ballot in 2018. Right. And so a lot of this is what affects the turnout, even though it's one Oops. step behind what people know. I want you both to stay with me. We want to broaden this out a little bit. We're talking about disenfranchisement. There's these other practices that are totally legal and have an impact. Consider this simple fact. The U.S. is one of the only countries where Election Day is on a work day, which means if you're a normal full-time working person, maybe you have some kids, it's very hard to get to the polls. And companies now are stepping up where the U.S. government hasn't. We want to spotlight one. The Blue Point Brewing Company actually has this effort to make Election Day a national holiday. They've put the petition right on their cans of beer, and they give their own workers a day off. To, to broaden this conversation to class, I want to bring in the co-founder of the brewing company uh, behind this effort, Mark Burford. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, you want to make sure it's easy for your employees to vote, regardless of who they vote for. Absolutely. At Blue Point, we believe you should be able to get to the polls. We created a company-wide holiday. We created the beer with the petition on it, and we want people to be able to vote every day or every time. And is, is your view from, from being a, a business owner, or as some would call it, a job creator? Mm -hmm. It's an old Romney quote. Um, as, a, as a job creator and a business owner, that this is something that working people, that your employees were having a harder time doing? Well, yeah, I mean, I know personally, my parents both worked full time. They commuted four hours a day to work and they made it to the polls every time, but it wasn't easy. It should never be that hard to vote. You should be able to vote. Election Day should be a national holiday. It'll help the country. What do you think about this, Donna? Because, you know, so often we're in, we're in the nitty gritty of it. You take a step back and remember, when you do phone banking, you call people and some of them say, yeah, I would want to vote. I got the kind of job and the kind of child care and the kind of situation where I, I can't get an hour out. First of all, I'm getting a six pack. <laughs> we all need one after this And election. I'm not even, my name is Donna. I'm getting a six pack. <laughs> uh, but election season, as you well know, begins now. People are voting early. They're voting in, uh, they're, they're able to vote on weekends, but in many states, they're now restricting that because of the great turnout efforts we've had. I remember a couple years Years ago, we were celebrating the fact that you can vote on Sunday. You go to church, and then we call it all souls to the polls. They're trying to get rid of that. So this is a great idea, but we also need a constitutional amendment to vote. We have 50 states with 50 different uh, rules and regulations, and that's why voting has become so difficult and, in this and country. And Berman, I want to I get into something that, you know, sometimes when you want to make plans with someone, and they don't want to hang out with you. They just claim they're too busy. Yeah. So it doesn't always mean everything. That never happened with us, but for other people. <laughs> um, but when you look at this, uh, the, the polling, not about who you vote for, but whether you vote at all, shows this. This is Pew Research Center from last year. One out of seven Americans, 14%, we could put this up, say they were basically too busy to vote. 
yeah. in 2016. 14%. That also is a margin. I think that's true. And you know, the whole concept of election day is totally antiquated. The reason why we vote on a Tuesday in November is because that's when farmers used to bring their crops to the market in the 1800s. So I think <laughs> every state not only should have voting be a national holiday, but we should have two weeks of early voting minimum. I think in every state in the country, we should be able to have it get, you could get an absentee ballot anywhere you live. We should have election day voter registration. So that if people miss a registration deadlines in all of these states, they can still show up at the polls and register to vote. If we did all of that, if we had early voting, election day registration, a national holiday so everyone could vote, we would have much higher voter turnout than it's, we have it, now. It's fascinating. It's a story you've been reporting on a lot. You know it from the inside. Uh, and you're a different kind of voice here coming out of a company trying to make time for your own employees, which we wanted to spotlight for a second because it's pretty interesting. My thanks to Donna, Ari, and Mark. Hey, I'm Ari Melber from MSNBC. You can see more of our videos right here, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel below. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and we appreciate that.